Should hostilities once break out between Japan and the United States, it would not be enough that we take Guam and the Philippines, nor even Hawaii and San Francisco. To make victory certain, we would have to march into Washington, D.C. and dictate the terms of peace in the White House. I wonder if our politicians, who speak so lightly of a Japanese-American war, have confidence as to the final outcome and are prepared to make the necessary sacrifices. In five hours on December 7th, 1941, the Japanese sank or severely damaged eight battleships, 10 smaller warships, and over 200 American aircraft. 24,000 U.S. soldiers and sailors lost their lives in what was essentially a surprise attack. There was no formal declaration of war, but sure enough, the attack itself, one of the worst defeats in U.S. naval history, brought the United States Armed Forces into World War II. Ten days after the Pearl Harbor attacks, the U.S. Pacific Fleet received a new Commander-in-Chief, Admiral Chester Nimitz. His swearing-in ceremony was on the deck of the submarine USS Grayling. Protocol dictated that this ceremony take place on board a battleship. However, all available battleships stationed at Pearl Harbor had been sunk or badly damaged. Nimitz, who had commanded battleships, cruisers, and destroyers between the wars, and served on destroyers in World War I, was quick to mobilize Navy forces in an effort to drive the Japanese from their recently occupied territories in the Pacific. In spite of the devastating loss of vessels, supplies, and manpower, Nimitz was able to use all available forces to halt the Japanese advance in the Pacific. As more men and warships became available, the fleet commander went on the offensive with successful naval campaigns, such as the Battle of the Coral Sea and the Solomon Islands campaign, including the Battle of Midway. He led successful amphibious attacks on Japanese stations in Iwo Jima and Okinawa. The latter operation was later called the last great battle of the war. The ferocity of the combat actions left 12,000 Americans dead, but the Japanese lost over 100,000. It was this battle that cemented the Navy's decision not to invade the Japanese mainland, and instead suggest the use of the atomic bomb to incur Japan's surrender. When the Japanese officially surrendered on September 2nd, 1945, Admiral Chester Nimitz signed the instrument of surrender as the official representative of the United States. President Franklin Roosevelt needed a senior military officer to advise him as the U.S. entered World War II. His choice was Fleet Admiral William Leahy, in the Navy since 1897, Leahy served in the Spanish-American War, as well as the Philippine-American War and the First World War. Leahy had formerly served as governor of Puerto Rico from 1939 through 1940, establishing military bases and initiating various public works projects on the island. He had also served as an ambassador to France shortly after that nation had come under German occupation in 1941, where his job, as Leahy himself put it, was to keep the French on our side in so far as possible. He was recalled to the United States in May of 1942, and two months later, he was the highest ranking member of the United States military, taking orders only from the president. In effect, he was the first chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. His knowledge of foreign policy was of great use to Admiral Leahy, who became the first naval officer to ever hold a five-star rank and was a conduit for all major military decisions of World War II. When the atomic bomb was first developed, Leahy strongly opposed its use on the enemy. 
Once it had been tested, President Truman faced the decision as to whether to use it. He did not like the idea, but he was persuaded that it would shorten the war against Japan and save American lives. It is my opinion that the use of this barbarous weapon at Hiroshima and Nagasaki was of no material assistance in our war against Japan. The Japanese were already defeated and ready to surrender because of the effective sea blockade and the successful bombing with conventional weapons. My own feeling was that in being the first to use it, we had adopted an ethical standard common to the barbarians of the Dark Ages. I was not taught to make wars in that fashion and that wars cannot be won by destroying women and children. Six months after the attack on Pearl Harbor, the United States Navy entered into three days of fighting that would prove pivotal in the Pacific theater of operations. Thanks to American code breakers, the Navy learned the date and location of a planned Imperial Japanese Navy attack on Midway Atoll located at the northwestern end of Hawaii. Admiral Nimitz mobilized every available aircraft carrier and a total of 41 planes, including Grumman TBF-1 Avengers. The force was enough to surprise the complacent Japanese attackers. The battle at Midway saw four Japanese aircraft carriers sunk, as well as a heavy cruiser. The United States Navy lost one carrier and one destroyer, along with 307 soldiers and sailors. The Japanese lost almost 10 times that number. This decisively defeated the Japanese and served as a tipping point in the favor of U.S. forces in the Pacific. There are no great men, just great challenges which ordinary men out of necessity, are forced by circumstances to meet. A 1904 graduate of the Naval Academy, William Bull Halsey, became one of the few officers to ever be promoted to lieutenant directly from Ensign, skipping over the lieutenant junior grade rank entirely. In 1909, Halsey began his career on the USS DuPont, a torpedo boat. Torpedoes and torpedo boats would become a specialty of his, and from 1912 through 1913, he commanded the first group of the Atlantic Fleet's torpedo flotilla. As the Navy evolved, so did Halsey. He began to see the aircraft carrier as a crucial offensive weapon system, rather as a mere defense mechanism to which some would relegate the vessels. If anything gets in my way, we'll shoot first and argue afterwards. Halsey was not hesitant to strike, and strike hard. His flagship, the USS Enterprise, was at sea, returning to his home base, Pearl Harbor, when it was attacked on December 7, 1941. Later, his carrier took part in raids on Japanese-controlled islands, as well as the Doolittle Raid, which dropped bombs on Japan's mainland in direct response to the Pearl Harbor attack. Illness kept Halsey from commanding his ship at the Battle of Midway, but in October of 1942, Halsey returned to command his ship for the actions at Guadalcanal, where Navy, Air Force, and Marine personnel were able to sink a total of two Japanese battleships, three destroyers, 11 transports, and downed 64 aircraft, effectively blocking supply routes from Japan that were key in taking the Solomon Islands. Nauru Island. Commander. Native knows position. He can pilot. 11 alive. Need small boat. Kennedy. That message was carved on a coconut and was to be the savior of 11 men in the Pacific theater of World War II. On August 2nd, 1943, between Arundo and Kalambangara in the Solomon Islands, the Japanese destroyer ship Amagiri, moving swiftly in the night to avoid United States detection, ran down the motor torpedo boat PT-109. It is unknown 
whether the destroyer meant this course of action or if they simply did not see the United States Navy vessel in the dark waters. In any event, the crew of PT-109 had only 10 seconds to respond to the impending enemy vessel. 109, as well as PT-162 and PT-169, were patrolling the area in search of enemy ships when the Amagiri surprised them. After the boat struck PT-109, cutting it in half, PT-169 fired upon the Amagiri, missing it. Assuming the crew of PT-109 lost, 169 and 162 returned to base. In fact, only two crew members aboard PT-109 were killed. The rest were led to the safety of a nearby island by their commander, a Harvard Varsity swim team alumnus, Lieutenant Junior Grade John F. Kennedy. The crew placed their shoes and non-swimmers on a timber used as a gun mount and kicked their feet for four hours, landing three and a half miles away on the deserted Plum Pudding Island, one of the few islands in the area not home to a Japanese installation. When the island was found to be without food or drinkable water, Kennedy then swam another two miles to find a habitable island. After relocating to a nearby island with fresh water and coconuts for food, the men were discovered by two natives who had been dispatched by an Australian coast watcher. Kennedy then carved his message on a coconut shell and sent the natives to the nearest U.S. Navy base at Rendova, and the PT-157 rescued Kennedy's beleaguered crew. I can imagine no more rewarding a career than any man who may be asked in this century what he did to make his life worthwhile, I think, can respond with a good deal of pride and satisfaction. I served in the United States Navy. Like many Americans, the attack on Pearl Harbor inspired George Herbert Walker Bush to enlist in the United States military. He became a naval aviator at 18 as part of the U.S. Navy Reserve, at the time the youngest aviator in Navy history. As a part of the Torpedo Squadron VT-51, his lanky physique earned him the nickname Skin, and his unit was victorious in one of the largest air battles of the war, the Battle of the Philippine Sea. On August 1st, 1944, Bush was promoted to lieutenant junior grade and was stationed on the carrier USS San Jacinto. As his squadron commenced attacks on Japanese installations on Chichijima in the Bonin Islands, Bush's Grumman TBM Avenger aircraft was shot. And even though one of the engines caught fire, Bush and his crew completed the mission, releasing bombs over their targets. Bush was forced to bail out of the Avenger, and the other three crew members were lost. He survived in an inflatable raft for four hours, with Japanese fighters flying overhead until his rescue by the USS Finback. This mission earned him the Distinguished Flying Cross. For heroism and an extraordinary achievement in aerial flight as pilot of a torpedo plane, in Torpedo Squadron 51, attached to the USS San Jacinto, in action against enemy Japanese forces in the vicinity of the Bonin Islands on September 2nd, 1944. Leading one section of a four-plane division in a strike against a radio station, Lieutenant Junior Grade Bush pressed home in an attack in the face of intense anti-aircraft fire. Although his plane was hit and set afire at the beginning of his dive, he continued his plunge toward the target and succeeded in scoring damaging bomb hits before bailing out of the craft. His courage and devotion to duty were in keeping with the highest traditions of the United States Naval Reserve. To the superb officers and men on land, on sea, in the air, 
and undersea who have performed such magnificent feats for our country in the past few days. You have written your names in golden letters on the pages of history and won the undying gratitude of your countrymen. My pride in you is beyond expression. No honor for you could be too great. Magnificently done. God bless each and every one of you. To the glorious Dead Hail Heroes, rest with God. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to help us produce more compelling historical content like this, please like, comment below, and share this video with fellow history buffs. And of course, be sure to subscribe to help keep history happening.